Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Artist Development, Music Production, and Songsmithing with Jared Finch. My name is Mallory Miznarsik, and I'm the project manager here at Harmon. Jared Fink. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during this webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter, and he'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded, and a link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. We encourage you to take a look at our different webinars in our Learning Sessions workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Jared, the presenter for today's webinar. Jared has earned three top 40 hits, won the USA Songwriter Competition, has toured extensively, and his music is routinely used in film and TV. He is currently signed to Anti-Fragile Music, under in Grooves and Universal as both artist and producer. He's professionally known as Blazer and is a staff composer at Scorekeepers. And now I'll pass it over to you, Jared. Hello, and thank you so much for the intro, Mallory. Well, everyone, it is uh, nice to meet you, and I'm, I'm glad you're here to join me. Uh, my name is Jared Fink, and as we get into this, um, the Jared Finch thing that happened is exactly why we kind of made this whole kind of branding shift as I went through my career. And uh, I'll explain that as we get into branding. Um, so just to kind of go through what we're gonna do here is I, I wanna basically talk to you and give a brief overview of how to be an artist, a producer, and, and make money in this industry because right now is the easiest time that I think it's ever been to do that if you have the drive and the work ethic. So I'll start this off by, you know, starting off just a little bit of an overview about myself and why you should even be listening to me. Um, my name is Jared Fink. I am professionally known as Blazar. I am an artist and a producer. I uh, produce for several labels, both major and indie, uh, for several artists. I write for other artists. I write for myself. I do plenty of collaborations and top lines with a lot of DJs around the country and around the world. And I've been doing this full time professionally for almost 10 years now. Um, I got my first record deal in 2012. And to kind of like chart this whole path, I just want to go through this with all of you. And then we can get into all of it. Um, basically, I started playing jazz uh, at a very young age. You know, I found my grandfather's trumpet when I was about six or seven. And I just kind of went through that. Music's always been a part of my life. My uh, grandparents were a touring country duo. My uh, other grandfather was in you know, choir his whole life and had perfect pitch and music was just always kind of a big part of my life. So it's not so much something I chose to be. It was just part of part of me from the start. And, and I think that a lot of people that are watching this podcast probably feel the same way. And, and I'm here to, you know, really show you my path because, uh, you know, I, I didn't come from money. My, my dad was an electrician. My mom was a banker. You know, my family uh, came from a small for farm town in Washington. And uh, it, it's been a grind the whole way. But I, I also think that the, there's merit to kind of building your career this way. And, and it cultivates not, not only the artist, but, but the work ethic that that's required. So to get back into this, um, I was playing jazz and I got a scholarship to play jazz in college. And I just kept doing that. And I was walking home from jazz rehearsal one day and I heard a band playing. It was actually based on a guitar player. And I asked them, you know, do you guys need a drummer? I hadn't played drums or anything. I just knew that I wanted to be in a band. So, uh, you know, they let me join. I was terrible. We were terrible. We were just basically covering Jimmy World and Weezer, but it, you know, it's kind of where I, I caught the bug. And uh, from that like kind of starting point, I started migrating to different instruments and piano and guitar and, and obviously then started writing songs and, you know, then trying to sing those songs. Um, and that was kind of my life for a while. I was going to college, you know, I loved music. I, I obviously wanted to have a career in music, but I wasn't banking on that. You know, I was, uh, I, I ended up getting a master's degree in psychology and, and working in that field for several years. But um, all the while I was still, you know, writing and playing music and, and gigging and like doing the weekend warrior thing and playing in cover bands and, and all these things, just trying to like find my pathway. Because the one thing that I hope that everyone learns from this seminar is that everyone's path is different. You know, there isn't one singular path. We, we all kind of get there in a different way. And, and all the people that I work with and know from like some of the biggest stars that I've worked with to some of the most indie people, like everyone that are successful, everyone has got there 
differently. And, and that's really important for all of you. But there's there is some like fundamental stuff that that they all have in common. And that is where, you know, I kind of started to build my career. So as I was like working in the hospital and doing all this mental health um, stuff that was was my life, you know, I was always writing songs and I, I wrote a song called Runaway. And it ended up winning this contest several years ago. If you guys remember like VH1 Save the Music, but it was with them and it was like song of the year and ended up winning song of the year, which uh, at that point was like the biggest thing that had ever happened to me. It was like a terrible recording of this acoustic track that I'd recorded in this guy's basement in Montana for like $100 and like uploaded to a website. And it kind of did a whole thing. And when I won this contest, I started having managers and labels reach out to me and I made some pretty good relationships there. And from there, I signed my first independent deal with a little label called Rock Ridge in 2012. Um, you know, at this point in my career, I was very Brian Adams, kind of Tom Petty, doing this whole acoustic guitar touring kind of thing. Um, you know, and, and I did that. You know, we, we uh, put Runaway out to radio, and that year it was the number one independent song in the country. Like, we charted in three formats, and it was a completely, like, grassroots organic campaign. We were mailing boxes, you know, to the radio stations out of my house. I had a a girl that was helping me at the time, um, you know, who was also working at AmeriCorps. So, I mean, we were all like, had no money. We were eating like rice and potatoes, but it was just something you know, that we wanted to do. You know, we had this little indie label kind of pushing us and, and we were all working together. And it was from that kind of like start that, that I really got into more of the industry side where I started making contacts at radio stations and program directors and music directors and like learning how like the whole kind of backside of the industry worked. And uh, from there, I was given an A&R position at, an, at another indie label where I started, you know, directly being the creative director for the label. And I was signing and looking for bands and doing music videos and creating marketing campaigns and doing radio campaigns and, and all of that kind of thing. Meanwhile, in my artist side, you know, I just kind of kept slowly progressing and, and putting out music. And I've been doing that since 2012, you know, and since Rock Ridge, I've had deals with, you know, Tone Tree, ADA, BMG, 1RPM, InGrooves, AWOL, Warner Brothers, um, and just to name a few. And, and I've consistently been putting out music. And, and the most important thing is that is that you can make a good living like doing this, like my, my family, I have a wife and a daughter, and then this is what I do. I've been doing nothing but this, you know, for, for the last decade, and you can too. Um, the main thing is just the work ethic that comes along with all this stuff, you know, and along with putting this kind of music out at this time, I was touring almost 200 shows a year. I've done lots of festivals. I played, you know, the rock boat live in the vineyard. Um, I've had a lots of music synced on film and TV on, you know, ESPN. I was the theme song for the U S open, the NBA finals, world series, ABC and NBC, tons of indie movies. I was actually in an indie movie called Janie charismatic where they used a bunch of my music and like all of these things aren't, uh, massive kind of uh, headline material, but but it is lots of just continued support. And, and that's kind of the model here is that if you just stick at it, you can get all of these kind of ancillary things that come together and will create, you know, an income stream for you and a lifestyle for you that you can keep doing this consistently. Um, and that's just a, a little bit of that. Uh, after after my uh, song Runaway that we put out, I put out a couple other singles. And, and I've just slowly kind of been grinding away at this and to like show the growth from 2012, the last song that I put out, you know, we sold 60,000 copies and it debuted on billboard at number 49. And that was all just completely independent, organic and independent is, is used in the term of independent and major labels, right? There's, there's really two tiers of independent artists. There are indie artists that, you know, are, are completely alone. And then there's indie artists on indie labels. And those indie labels can be uh, an investor who just wants to, you know, believe in an artist as, you know, the full working indie labels, like the one I'm on at Annie Fragile right now. And they come in all shapes and sizes. But but when I when I say independent, that's that's kind of what I'm talking about, like not a major label, not a Beyonce or, you know, Kanye level artist, clearly. Um, the main thing that I, I really want to get across, too, is that today's music scene is vastly different than I think it's ever been before and especially you know in this pandemic you know as you can see i have haven't had haircuts since march i've been living in a cave in this quarantine so it's nice to be coming here <laughs> from the quarantine but today's music scene is very very open 
I mean, we're, we're all connected via these social networks. We're, we're all using things like Spotify and Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Instagram. And there are ways to leverage these networks and get yourself in front of the right people to grow yourself organically for very low amounts of money. You know, we're not talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. When I started really kind of working this stuff that I'm going to talk to you all about, you know, I was doing $5 a day. You know, and that's like $150 a month. You know, if you just don't buy your Starbucks for the day, you can go and kind of start these, these programs. So I really want to, to tell you that like, it really just takes doing it. And that's the most important thing that I can say. And like the focus these days, you know, it used to be so much about like, let's put out a single and let's go to radio and let's do this big push. And like that whole model has moved since we've, we've gone away from like buying music. And the best way that I can describe this and that I tell people that I work with, you know, is that think of your music almost as free at this point. You know, it's like you're, you're almost giving them the content and you're making your income from all of the stuff that comes from that content. If it's sync or if it's merchandise or if it's usage rights or if it's a YouTube or, you know, it's plays on, on streams on Spotify and all these kinds of things. You know, that's the way that you have to look at it because the truth is people are not buying records anymore, right? I mean, we're not going to records or some people are obviously, but it's just not it, like it used to be. When I sold that 66,000 copies of my single criminal uh, last year, two years ago, two years ago, excuse me, that was the number one independent song for that period in the entire world. You know, and those are not huge astronomical, astronomical numbers. So I, I really want to like, stress that, that the model is changing and we're in this very kind of adapt or die kind of model right now, you know, and especially with the pandemic. So right now, the people that control the music industry for the first time maybe ever are content creators. And that's what this whole podcast is about, because you can do this from your basement. You can do this from your house if you have the drive and you have the talent, right? Obviously, you can't make terrible songs, great songs but we can make terrible songs, better songs, you know, by doing a lot of this kind of stuff. So I really want to talk about how we, how we uh, do this every day. So now let's get into basically like, what are you, you know, are you an artist? Are you a songwriter? Are you an instrumentalist? Are you a session worker? Because these are very different things, right? Are you, do you want to be an artist? Are you just trying to be a songwriter? Are you trying to get your songs placed with other artists? Are you trying to be, uh, are you a guitar player who wants to be an instrumentalist for, for, for work in a studio or session work? You know, are you just doing instrumentalist music? Are you doing composer cues? Like what exactly is your field? And you have to define that because they're very different things, right? There isn't a lot of people that are doing all of them. You know, usually it's like you kind of focus in one area and then you can branch out from there. I definitely started as an artist. You know, if I looked back at my career to where I am now, you know, now I'm a full fledged like artist producer. This is literally what I do all day, every day, sit in the studio and write and craft songs and kind of edit and do cues for TV and film and on top of my own artist career. And, and I kind of think that evolution towards this kind of mobile hotspot of content creation is where the whole music industry is headed. It's headed towards people like me and hopefully like you who can go and do the complete package by yourself. You can produce, you can write, you can do all these kinds of things, or you're in a circle that does that. It doesn't necessarily have to be you. Like I have tons of, of writing groups and friends in LA that I go down when I fly down there to do my projects. And, and there's five or six guys and like maybe one of them's really good at video. Maybe one of them's really good at production and mixing and mastering and you have like the guitar player whatever it is the point is like you create these little ecosystems to where you are completely in control of the entire product as you push it out because the leverage comes from that point and that creates all of your negotiation points and that creates the, the need for you right and that's the most important thing is that you have to create the means for you to be the focal point of this whole thing so Let's also talk about engineer, producer, mixer, and mastering. Now, it's kind of the same thing of, of what I was just talking about, but it, along the lines of like, I feel like I'm a producer, right? I also mix, I also engineer, and I also master, but I don't do all of those things, you know, as well as some other people do. Like there's our mastering ninjas out there. There's engineering ninjas out there. There's mixing ninjas out there and producers, whatever. The point is to like really be a, be realistic and truthful with where you are at in the industry. And this comes from simple things like a being and being realistic about your mixes and your production, like having a very, very firm understanding of where that you are, because the only way that, that you can move forward is by becoming this kind of content creation and also delivering the content at the level that it needs to be. 
Um, there's there's tons of fields too, like non music career fields, where if, you know a lot of the best managers and a lot of the best A&R guys and, and label people that I've met through the years were guys that were in bands or are musicians or are guitar players, and they just kind of like found their niche in, in different parts of that. And I think that's something that everyone just kind of has to weigh. And the point of what I'm what I'm talking about right now is that you need to pick the thing that you most fervently are and then you kind of expand your hat from there it's like the what was the tip of your spear are you a writer are you an artist are you an engineer are you a mixer or a master like you have to find that thing so that you can become the most proficient at that and then you expand from there because you cannot do everything at that level right but you still have to have that kind of focal point and so that's kind of the start of this whole thing um, the second thing is just routine and work ethic and this is something that you know i learned I think I literally learned on the farm, you know, it's like, you just have to do it. And it's an insane amount of, of work to actually do it and to do it well these days. And, and, and I'm not talking about just production. It's like when, when I get up in the morning, like you have to like set fragment your day. It's like, I do a, a section of, of like, where I'll do like guitar drills or work on piano and just kind of like noodle around and, and do things like that. Then I also do like, I try to do some continued education and, you know, look, get on YouTube and like watch some of the new mixing guys or the songs that I like, you know, I'll look up who produced that, who mixed that and go check them out and see what they're writing about, what techniques they're doing. Because recording is this constantly evolving thing. So I, I make sure to do that every day. The, the second thing that, or the third thing that I do that everyone should do is write every day, right? You know, I, I've written songs with some of the biggest songwriters in music. In fact, the, when I won the USA Songwriting Competition, I wrote that song with David Hodges. I mean, he's 60 million records or something. I think he's sold. I, I don't remember the exact number, but he's tons of number ones. And like, he's a huge deal. And he was the one that told me specifically, it's like, you have to write every day, you know? And it's like, it's not, it's not so much about writing a hit or a great song every day. It's just, it's just, just working this muscle. It's doing this kind of routine thing, you know? And if you write two or three really great songs a year, like that was a good year. The point is to like keep working that muscle and get in the routine of doing it so that you're not like just writing when you feel inspired or when like your energy up or energy is up. Or if you've taken your supplements for that day, you know, like your B6 and your B12 and you're flying. The, the point is that you make yourself do it every day and you eventually just start getting better right? It's, it's just kind of refining all of these things. And it's not only that, it's like studying, like, what are we talking about? What are we writing? Who are we writing after? It's forming all of these kinds of things into just a work ethic, you know? And then after you, you do the writing, and then I also do like production mixing, right? I'll do three or four hours of that. On top of all of that, you have to set aside social networking time, right? I mean, literally every night for like two hours, I sit on Instagram and Twitter and I go around and I engage, you know, with all these kinds of things. And I'll, I'll get into how we can do that better too. But the point is to like fragment your day and make sure that you are doing all of these things because so much about music and so much about production and, and, and artistry and, and living this lifestyle is just doing it. You know, I, I don't know how many artists that I've worked with over the years that said, oh, you know, the, the stuff I'm working on right now is so much better than this. And, oh, you, you're going to love this new record I'm working on. And then, then that's kind of like the common theme that goes over and over and over in music is that people are always talking about things and people are always promising things. The only thing that I can tell you is just do it. That's all that you have to do. Sit down in your room, write the songs and keep doing it. Practice production, practice mixing learn what others are doing, sit and engage with people. If you don't have a social network, start engaging on your social networks, all these kind of simple things that you just have to do. And some of it's like not so much fun. I understand that, but it's just part of the whole thing. If you want to be successful at music, you have to go out and you have to do it every day. Try to move this next slide here. So um, let's get into like some basic songwriting stuff because this is where... I felt my niche always was like, I always had a, a, a pretty strong natural talent for melody and, and picking out and putting together songs. Um, the thing that I think people don't understand is that when you start playing in the game with like published writers and working with indie labels and, and signed artists, like everyone in the room is talented, right? These days of like you sitting in your dorm or you're like the guy that could play guitar or whatever could sing like that stuff's over. Everyone is as good as you or better. And that's the mentality that you have to have. So when you go into these rooms and you go into these things, you just have to be humble and you have to take this approach of that you are not 
it's just, it's a constant learning process. Like you're not the best in the room. You, you have to kind of get out of this small town mentality. And I really didn't learn that until I did get down in LA and Nashville and New York. And I started doing kind of bigger sessions with people. And it was just mind blowing to me, the talent that some of these people have. But the most important thing I learned was that everyone is talented, right? Like everyone has to get to that kind of threshold to be in the room in the first place, right? So if everyone's functioning at this like 93 or 92% level, you know, of like, talent it's that next three to four percent that makes those songs good to great and that's that grinding part of like doing this career and that's that grinding part of doing the repetition every day making yourself that much better you know it's just like how much do you train on top of your natural talent because that's what separates you from everyone else is that little extra bit and so as we go through this repetition, that's the most important thing every single day, work on it. Even if it's just writing hooks, like a lot of the artists that I work with or that I develop, I tell them, don't even worry about the whole song. Give me 12 bars of hooks or give me eight bar hooks or taglines, like just write choruses, just write this until you get in the, in the habit of developing these kind of like hooks that you know that that are, are symmetrical on both ends and answer each other and have taglines and they can start like developing these things as opposed to like writing a bit of a song and then kind of filling in the rest with like oh that's good enough because the minute you start doing that and the minute you start settling on any part of this stuff is the second that you're kind of out of the game because there's people like me that aren't settling you know and i'm not saying that i'm the best out there but i'm saying that i will work as hard as anyone out there and that's the mentality of everyone that is doing this because it's that's the game now it's this very kind of like street fight everyone is in it everyone can can play everyone can compete you know all these mediums are open and and, and i'll show you all how to do that as we keep going here um the song staging direction structure and theme i think this is the most important thing that i always tell aspiring songwriters is quit trying to reinvent the wheel right there there's a structure for songs there there and, and granted you can move things around obviously you can go a b a b a b c a b c whatever whatever the form is but there there is always the kind of same things, right? There's like, there's like your verse and your lift and your chorus and your kind of tag and, and the way the energy flows and creating dynamics and all these kind of things that are just very, very rudimentary songwriting, you know, and, and all the time, you know, I have artists who, who send me demos of things that they want me to produce. And there's like two and a half minutes of verse. or there's like a 45 second intro, or there's like all these kind of extended solos. And, and, and I, I always respond with the same thing. Like, who are you listening to right now currently? And how does your stuff compare to that? Like, like, who are you trying to be? What are you trying to model yourself after? And I'm not saying copycat. Like, you, you, every, every artist, like, like, you still have to paint within the borders of the painting, for, for my analogy. Because the main thing is that if you want to compete, you have to be able to do things like, that that are being successful now right it's like you have to look at themes and you have to look at lyrical themes and feelings and vibes and, and like beats and all these kind of things that are going on in the current meta of the system that you're competing in not music that you listened to in 1972 unless you're just doing this as a passion project right i mean that's the thing like if you want to compete and you want to make a living you have to be in the current system so what i would say is that a, a thing that i that i started doing a while ago was i started watching you know, just commercials, right? Because I, I noticed that a lot of the bands that I liked when I started researching, like how they got signed or how they got picked up or how they built these massive organic audiences, a lot of it came from sync, right? And sync is synchronization. It's TV or film or commercial, right? All the music that you see on anything, Netflix or, you know, a Swiffer commercial, what have you. And one of the most successful guys that I know at Sync, who literally makes over half a million dollars a year just doing commercials, um, he, he has a notebook and he started like writing down like BPMs and like themes in these commercials. And, and there are patterns, right? There is this kind of like stream of consciousness that goes through all of this stuff. It's, it's, in, it's in TV, it's in film, it's in commercials and it's in radio and it all echoes each other. It's all this kind of like moving target. And if you're, you kind of have to start paying attention to these trends and, and living in the moment, right? And so we started doing this thing and like he showed me if he was doing it and I started doing it and I started having a lot of success with commercial sync just because it was like, if I'm going to set out to do work, right? Today, I want to go out and I want to make money off of this song. It's like, okay, what am I going to do today? Is this something for my artist career? Is this something from my like, 
what I, what I call like my fundamental, or is this something for like a pitch, right? And I think all of these things are, are your direction, right? So if this is an artist track and it's just for your artist career or for you, which is what I always tell artists, your artist career needs to be for you, right? And then we want to try to aim that towards something that could be commercial as opposed to in commercial. I don't mean mainstream. I just mean commercial as in a marketable pro product. Um, Fundamental is what I call when like you start researching what is being synced in TV, film and commercials and you start writing things for that and, and, and forward thinking about, well, you can start to see this kind of like evolutions like right now we've been in this kind of 80s synth wave thing going on. And now if you're all paying attention, like we're starting to see guitars and all this kind of punk thing come back. Right. And like you, you start seeing these trends and you start seeing what people are asking for and commercials. For, for whatever reason, always seem to be a little bit in front. And that's probably just because of the turnaround time where, you know, film and TV is six months to a year in production, commercials are much less. And so when you start like researching all these things that are getting used heavily, because there's lots of websites and sources on Google where you can go and see what songs are being used in what commercials, all these kinds of things, you start to see trends, right? So that's, that's where you need to start driving your brain. And then the third way that to do this is just like artist pitch. And that's like, if you want to pay, say pitch a song to the weekend, right? You know, you're, you're researching what kind of songs they sing and you're making stuff specifically for that. And I can tell you all how to kind of do that too. Um, studio writing rooms and collaboration. Uh, this is something that I learned way too late in my life. Um, up until probably three or four years ago, I had written every song I'd ever released by myself. And I was one of those kind of completionists where it's like, I want to do this by myself. I want to, you know, I, I want to do it, you know, and I, I think people kind of have that initial reaction. A lot of creators, a lot of artists, like they want to be the one that, that's, that's doing this because it is this kind of like vulnerable expressionism. It's this very internalized thing. And, and it is hard to kind of relinquish some of that control. Um, in, in production land, we always call it driving. Like who's driving? Is the artist driving the session or is the producer driving the session? Um, that's something that I feel like everyone struggles with. And I think collaboration is key. Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't, there, there aren't a lot of singular artists in the history of music that were monstrously successful by themselves. I mean, there's a couple, right. But not, not many. It was always like Lennon McCartney or Simon and Garfunkel or, you know, Tom Petty and the heartbreakers, you know, whatever kind of model that you want to go through. But there is this kind of thing that comes from collaboration. And I always say, this it's like we all kind of have our toolkit right we all kind of do our own little box of tricks and it's like we all kind of live in that little box and when you combine other people's toolkits you start like expanding into new areas that you normally wouldn't do by yourself and there is this kind of collaborative energy that just makes things better bouncing ideas off brainstorming working with other talented people it's the greatest thing to do for anyone's music because it allows people to objectively critique you in real time as well, as long as you with them. And it makes everyone elevate their work ethic. You know, it's not you in a room by yourself, like, oh, that's good enough. It's like, you're really with someone who wants something to be very successful with you. You know, and that kind of uh, mentality is what the music is all about. It's having as many people wave the same flag as possible. You know, this, this kind of, of parade is the only way that it works. And I just, you know, uh, it was just such a life-changing experience for me. Um, you know, and I, I, everyone needs to do that. Um, completionism is kind of this thing that I, I, I just kind of developed myself and, and I feel like it's just kind of my fundamental philosophy about music. And that is just that the act of doing and all of these kind of things that we're talking about, the song staging, the collaboration, like just the act of doing gets your body into this kind of routine. And I can't stress that enough. Just keep doing it going. If you're a producer, just go down and do it every day. Like play with the knobs, get into the, into the system, into the DAWs. You know, if you're, if you're mixing, like get in there and mix stuff. If you're writing, get in there and write stuff. Like you just have to do it. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Like there's something that happens in your mind when you keep doing things and you actually complete them and put them out into the universe. And like that energy, whatever that is, that act of doing, I think is over half of the battle because I've noticed that 
it, it's, uh, you know, everyone always kind of talks about the secret and I'm not going to get into that too, too much because I don't believe necessarily that, but I do believe that there is this act of volition where if you do things, you are paving the path forward for yourself. It's like all of these kind of, of movements of energy are what we all need to be doing if we want to build these careers for ourselves. And so, yes, if you want to be a professional writer, you have to go down, you have to constantly write. So, like I said, I did do a lot of a &R, you know, as I was kind of doing this artist career. And so I do kind of really appreciate both vantage points. Like my whole time as an artist career, you know, I've had several indie label deals at this time and, and on a couple of majors and several publishing deals and booking agencies. And, and the one thing that you will always learn as an artist is a, is a term called defensive arguments. And that is when you start having real conversations with labels, they, they are just as upside down as everyone else now. That's right. They're looking for functioning business models. So the whole conversation turns into this, well, they're going to try to poke holes in this thing that you're pitching to them because they want to make sure that it's real, right? Because we live in the age of bots and all these other kinds of things. So let's set that aside for a minute because I want to come back to it. The artist development side, with all of that said, you have to go and you have to create the entire platter now. Like there is no artist development. Labels are not putting money into developing acts anymore. It, that this whole like notion of you can play in the garage and someone's going to come and find you like didn't exist 10 years ago and it doesn't exist now. Um, the only thing that matters is functioning business models, right? So what is the product? You know, branding. And this, this is the hardest thing. It was a hard thing for me to do. It was a hard thing, I think, for every artist to do. And that's like, you have to specifically write, what, what are you? Like, what is your brand? Because as an artist, the thing that you're selling is yourself. As a producer, the thing that you're selling is yourself. You know, like you're selling your productions. You're selling your artistry. You're selling, it's all kind of the same thing. So you have to figure out what that brand is. And you have to be very clear with that brand. And, and the themes of this, and I'm talking simple things like, colors like like having the same fonts like like making sure all your social networks look the same you know all these kind of little things that that are awful and tedious make all the difference in the world because it starts creating this kind of symmetry where people who get into your ecosystem start seeing this and they start diving into your ecosystem and seeing all the things in the content that you have you know and, and i didn't this was another thing that i just kind of learned as, as i went along and it's literally probably the single most important thing that I've that I've changed for myself in the in the last few years. Um, I, I went by Jared Fink for almost nine years, and this uh, last year I signed a, a pretty large deal with Annie Fragile under under this new moniker that I'm going by is Blazar, um, and it, it's a very much like a Daft Punk kind of production team where we're working with a ton of artists and all these kinds of things. And so when I developed this idea and I pitched it, you know, cause the label was going to sign me as Jared. And I, and I was like, no, you know, I kind of have this idea and, and I'd gone through all this. Like I had the branding, right? I pitched this idea. What, what is this? And, and I was very specific about what I wanted this thing to be, what I wanted this amalgam to do, what I wanted it to look like, what I wanted the colors to be, what I wanted it to be sonically. And I wrote all this down on a, on a piece of paper, right? And it all sounds stupid, but it's like, these things matter. And once I started visualizing exactly what I wanted Blazar to be, I just started doing that, right? And this came from, from simple things to, to like the branding of the images to like more creative things. Like sonically, I started putting like a little notch in all of my EQs, you know, at a, at a certain frequency to create this kind of like digital fingerprint and all these other kinds of like things that you can get creative with. Um, it's, it's just so important. And the most important thing that I want to talk to you all about marketing, and I could do a whole seminar on this alone, but I'm going to try to do the fast food version here, is that Facebook is not a network for sharing cats and talking and arguing about politics, even though that's, that's all that we do. Like Facebook is a marketing machine. It is built as a marketing machine. It is built as an advertising vessel. So every person on here, and just to uh, a little addendum or side note here, don't ever push the boost post button. Don't ever do the boost on Twitter. Don't ever do the boost post on Facebook. The way that you do this is through Facebook Biz Manager. It's very important. There's a thing in there called the Facebook Pixel. 
everyone needs to create this. And what the Facebook pixel is, is it's this little uh, artificial intelligence engine that you can plug into all of your adverts, you know, that can go out and it starts learning, you know, what people are reacting to your music, what people are clicking through to your music. And you can create the Facebook pixel to start finding who your audience is and creating lookalike audiences. Now there's tons of ways to do this. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to the to the company that I used to to uh, kind of facilitate this, and that's called Hyped It. There are tons of things that do this, but basically the idea is that you're going to create your ad, and and the vessel is is usually a 30 second clip, or if you're a producer, it's a 30 second clip of whatever you're doing. You know the, the music of your production or something about your production, and you have this kind of vessel. And Hyped It has these great portals. You can create them yourself. It's just more busy work. But basically, the vessel is is a system to track click throughs, so the pixel can learn. Right. So like to start out on, on on one of my tracks, I had one called Better, and I used Hyped It, and and I literally was only doing five dollars a day. I mean, for, for $150 a month. And I went in and hyped it and I created my like better ads and I, and I synced it up to like Michael Jackson, Calvin Harris and uh, The Weeknd and a few other guys. And then, and then I had the pixel go out and start looking. And after about a month, you know, this pixel through the system had determined who my audience was, like had got the CPC down to like two cents on some of these clicks. And it was just insane amounts of results. And then you can create these Facebook look like audiences and start to scale things. Because once you have your audience, there's three, there's hundreds of millions of people on Facebook, right? I don't know the exact number, probably 300 or 400 million people, I think is the last number I, I saw. But the point is that uh, there's room for everyone. So all you have to do is find out who your audience is and then you can start to scale it. So please like take the time, go on YouTube, look up what a Facebook pixel is. It's very, very easy. You basically just go into your biz manager, you go to your events manager and it says create new data source. It's like a green circle with a plus sign. You just create your pixel. It will give you a little number up in the say, we'll say F Facebook pixel ID and there's a number. That number you can put on your websites. You can put that on, on all of your advertising, everything. And it starts keeping track of every single person who comes to your website, how long they click and you can set the parameters, right? So like on my ad right now, I have it set to when they actually make it to Spotify and subscribe to my playlist, right? That's considered like a full click through of my system. So I start seeing like who went there and then I start doing, creating look like audiences of who those people are. And you start to scale that, you know, at a factor. And even now, like, um, I'm still only doing about $1,500 a month in ads. Like I've totally scaled up to that, but the ROI on, on streaming is not as bad as, as some people would have you believe. Like, and it's not great, but you can make an, a living doing this. Basically it works out to every million streams is $4,400 total. that comes back minus your distributor if you're on tune core or whatever your deal is. Um, that, that, that roughly equates to like three, 300,000 ish uh, monthly listeners because each monthly listener usually listens two to three times. And that's kind of, you know, the, the number that I use when I, when I'm building all these programs or I'm helping other artists kind of market their music. Um, other simple things that, that you need to do after you develop this kind of pixel system and you've started putting your ads together, you know, make sure that you have your private playlist on your, on your Spotify too, you know, because that's another way you put music that you love with your music and you can start driving ads to that too. And why that's important is you start building up a followership on your own playlist, which, which get residual plays to, for more passive income. Right. And you can just keep growing these systems over and over and over again. Um, so everyone just like, like really, really look at the Facebook biz manager, checked out, hyped it, you know, because it's, I think it has a great walkthrough of how, of how to do this. If you don't want it, or just look on YouTube, you know, there's tons of things, but basically it doesn't cost a fortune. You know, I built my entire Blazar audience at $150 a month and I've been scaling that slowly, you know, over the last year. You know, now we're sitting over 200,000 monthly listeners. My, my playlists are starting to do well. And it's just a very slow grind process. Um, but it, it's, it's important. So let's talk about social networks a little bit. And I feel like people don't really use these well either. Um, you know, social networking is the lifeblood of every artist producer out there right now. And the main thing that I will tell everyone is that the most important thing is to make them real. You know, there's a million websites out there selling bots and all this kind of like BS to inflate your numbers. And, and, you know, years ago that, that kind of worked for a minute, you know, but now everyone is hip to that. 
the labels are hip to that. Like everyone knows because there's, there's so much data and analytics and backdoor stuff. And like, people can see that these are bots and like, there's no engagement when you have like a million followers on Twitter and you have three likes, like it looks ridiculous when you have 500,000 people on Instagram and no comments on every post, like it's clearly BS. Right. So why are you even doing that? Um, you know, my accounts are not massive. I think right now on Instagram, I've got like 37,000 or 38,000, but my engagement's through the roof. Um, and I constantly have labels and, and marketing people talking about like how my, and, and I get tons of like advertising deals and sponsorship things just because my engagement is, is, is through the roof because it is all real, you know? And it, I think, and I, I tried the same stuff that everyone else did, you know, years ago, I, I was doing engagement groups. I was doing like shout out stuff, like trying to find like how to, how, what's the way to do this. And through this process, like I learned the most simple thing. It's like, it's not engagement groups. Like all of Instagram is an engagement group, right? The entire network is an engagement group. Like you don't need to get in these little message boxes of, of comment trades and all this other stuff and follow for unfollow and all this garbage that's going on. Like all you have to do is just start engaging people. So literally like for two hours every night, I'll go and I'll look up like the weekend or I'll look up some Duran Duran or whatever I'm into at that moment, listening to you. And I'll just start going through their things and I'll start commenting back to people and just talking to people. And it's amazing how many of those people come over and start following. And then you just engage with them on your thing. You start doing DMs and, and, and literally just use all of Instagram as an engagement group. I know it doesn't, maybe it doesn't sound like fun or it's a little like, oh, it's just not cohesive. But I'm telling you, if you just do it, you'll get massive amounts of people coming over for however much time you're going to put into it. But it's just a matter of doing it. It's the same thing. And again, uh, you know, and I, it's the same thing with Twitter, you know, you know, Facebook, it's, it's all, all kind of the same thing. Um, Facebook is a little bit different now because they kind of have this like paywall system, right? Which is why we use the biz managers so to, because biz Facebook owns Instagram, right? So when you get into your biz manager, you can migrate your Instagram account into your biz manager with your pixel and you can start running your ads that way, which if, if you guys all go to my account, it's at Jared Fink, that's J E R A D F I N C K go there and you can see my ads, right? And I, I interact with every single person that's on my things. I'm running all of that through biz manager, through my pixel. I'm running all of that on, on these kind of low dollar budgets, right? I've got four songs out now and each one of those songs I'm doing these kind of low dollar budgets on. And it's, it's really turned into a thing where it becomes this kind of profile cohesiveness as a brand. So the main thing is like just consistency, just keep doing it. If you keep doing it, you will see dividends. I promise you. So um, this is kind of like some nuts and bolts stuff about how we make money in the industry. And I, I'm, I know I'm going fast through all this stuff and I'm trying to give everyone just an overview of basic stuff because a lot of people don't know this. You know, I get asked these kind of questions all the time. You know, publishing, licensing, royalty collection. This is the lifeblood of the music industry. This is everything. It is no longer about touring. It is no longer about radio sales. It is about this. And everyone who is a content creator, be it a producer or an artist songwriter, or an artist producer or a composer, whatever, this is where you live. Um, the main thing that, that we have to talk about is what is publishing, right? So on every song on the planet, there, there are two sides and it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but this is just how the system works. There are the master rights and there are the publishing rights. The master rights, excuse me, are usually with the artist, right? And the artist that's releasing the song, that, that's what you're buying when you like pay a producer to produce your song or or you create the song or you own the, the master recording, you pay a studio, like you own that master, right? The publishing right is the other side of the song, which is the composers of the people that are responsible for writing. So how this works is like, say that you wrote a song with your friend and you're putting it out as an artist and you get a $10,000 sync from MTV. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but you, you get a $10,000 sync and how that works is they end up having to pay that number twice, right? They pay the $10,000 to the master side and they pay the $10,000 to the publishing side split up among the, the writers of the track. Now that that's why every, that's why writing this content becomes so important because all of the royalties and all of, all of the kind of streaming income that comes from that, from that sync gets paid out through the publishers. So the companies that, that collect for this are, are your PROs, you know, and the big ones are ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Now you can choose any one of them. They all kind of function the same. I'm personally with ASCAP and that was just because at the time I, you know, arbitrarily chose them and I didn't know what I was doing. Now I'm happy. They're a great company. Uh, 
they're all, they all function the same though. So basically you create your music, you upload it to your PRO, they do surveys, you know, of the digital fingerprint to collect all your royalties, right? So everyone on here needs to go to ASCAP or BMI and create your publisher and your, your writer site or your artist, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing. And sometimes it's both. Like I have an artist and a writer account on ASCAP. Um, it just depends on how you're releasing music from there. You know, you have to have like your business license and your S Corp and all that kind of stuff set up. But, but ASCAP and, and that's kind of like your bedrock now there's other companies called that like sound exchange is one that a lot of people don't know about and this they collect for things that are called like involuntary streams for the master owner because there isn't really a pro that does this so it's just another thing it's like if it's different than like youtube where it's like you a person is voluntarily clicking it's more like ancillary music you know and it, it's all kind of like muddy who collects what but the point is just register for all of them <laughs> with all of your music and then you'll start seeing money right once we start getting synced. So that's the next question. Like, how do we start getting synced? Um, I've had my stuff used in everything, you know, like, like tons and tons of TV shows, tons of movies, like commercials, other artists have used it, the podcasts, like all over. And, and the main thing is just, you start sending it out. I started with taxi, right. And I think everyone's heard of taxi and that's a great, like, kind of like open source thing for people who are just getting started and it's like two or 300 bucks a year and they send out opportunities and like, Hey, you can submit to this and this and this, you know, I got a couple of those and that led to some other things, but the real stuff started happening for me with non-exclusive boutique companies, catalog companies, and then obviously publishers and publishing administration. And those are all very different things. So catalog companies are companies that, that just kind of like take songs, in mass loads and they just take all of these songs and they acquire as many as they possibly can. And they end up unloading these catalogs to other publishers who kind of like use them in their catalogs. And it's, it's really kind of like the, the, the bottom, the bottom feeding part of the publishing industry. And I don't recommend anyone start there unless like everything else fails. And it's kind of like here, you can always give your music to a catalog company where you want to go are things that are working specifically with like underscore sync or boutique sync. Right. And there's there's tons of these companies. Just look up like boutique publishing on Google or look up underscore companies. One like one the one of the ones that I work for is called Scorekeepers. And we just do underscore for television. I'll spend two days a week where I'm literally just doing like piano kind of horror soundtracks, or if I'm doing sound effects, or if I'm making like whatever kind of music for whatever show has been commissioned, you know, that we're doing for that that time. Um, but that that's everyone can do that. Like if you're a producer and you're making instrumental music or if you're an artist, right? And, and you're just writing songs, like these kind of underscore companies are great because they're looking for songs from artists. So like they'll take your whole song and they'll sync it in TV and like you'll have an exclusive deal with them. And from that deal, you can start building a sync history. So then you can start approaching publishing companies because after you start getting any kind of sync and these can be low dollar things. I had a catfish sync on MTV. I think it was like $250, right? It wasn't a huge deal, but that led to other opportunities because once you start developing a sync history, then you, then you have like worth as a publisher. So you can start approaching these kind of boutique publishers and there's tons of them all over the country that have lots of success. And just a simple Google search of boutique publishers, you'll find tons of them and you can go and research them. And basically it's the same thing. After you've got a little bit of sync history or after you have like a portfolio put together of stuff that you think is great, maybe like three songs, you pitch yourself. You're like, hey, I'm a content creator or I'm a producer. You know, here's some stuff I produce. You know, would you be interested in representing me? And most of these boutique publishers are going to offer these things called non-exclusive deals, which is what you want when you're starting out so that your music isn't tied up in one place. A lot of these catalog companies that I was talking about at the start are going to want exclusivity, exclusivity um, of all of your music because that's how they function because they want to be able to sell it. A lot of these boutique publishers will do non-exclusive deals because they know that like, everyone is kind of doing this. Like if, if you're getting in the game at, at a publishing level, like you're obviously talking to other publishers or other boutique publishers. So after you've got a little bit of a sync history and you've got some of those things, your next step is to head towards like full publishing deals, right? And those come in either administration or publishing deals. Administration is basically, they function as like another tier of your PRO and it'll take usually 15% and they'll do all of your collection for the world and really make sure things are happening because ASCAP, as good as they are, like are mostly run by a lot of volunteer people and, 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 they're, and they represent everyone. I mean, there's like millions of artists, right? So it's like, they represent everyone. So if you're not, you know, on the top 
whatever percentage of that food chain, sometimes you get ignored. Having these kind of boutique publishers or administration deals will help make sure that your stuff is being recognized and collected for. So the main thing I would say is like, work on your content, work on your production, start a being things to make sure that you're competitive and then start fishing it out to these like boutique companies and these underscore companies and all these guys that do this. And they'll tell you right away, like, Hey, we're interested or, Hey, this isn't quite up to snuff. But the point is like, once you start getting in that system and developing it, like it becomes this residual income machine for you because the great stuff about like underscore or any sync stuff is that you keep getting checks in the mail after it airs every time it airs if it's on repeat if another country picks it up like it, all of these things just kind of keep going and going and that becomes your argument for leverage with publishers as you move forward so you can start asking for advances against whatever income they think they're going to you know receive off of you for that year i'm not quite there yet so i just kind of i really want to want to stress that important part um the other thing that i really wanted to get into you know, before, before I wrap this up about production is that, you know, I, I wasn't always a professional producer either. Like I always produce, but it probably over only the last three or four years has my stuff really that I've done solely by myself been used on TV and film. And like, I'm mixing and mastering and producing, like I'm doing it by myself. And I would just say like the, the easy addiction that I think a lot of people get uh, caught up in is, is the gear race. Right. Um, you know, we all want to have these kind of like crazy studios and, 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 all this stuff and, and, and none of it's necessary. Um, I think I, I got my US open sync on, on a MacBook Pro with headphones and one microphone using GarageBand. Um, you know, you, you can do everything that you need for low amounts of money. And, and that's kind of, of what I, I really want to stress to people is like, now is the best time on earth to go and utilize all of these tools in a way that's never been here before. We have so many things open to us. Spotify is demonized by so many people, but it is such a good thing for artists because it is a platform built to discover artists. If your music starts getting saved, if it's reacting well, their algorithms are built to make you rise up and they're built. And there's so many people that have come from this system, you know, and the whole point of that is that we can use these advertising techniques to make sure that our stuff is getting in front of people and point it towards these systems to start getting these kind of algorithms to work for low amounts of money with content that you are creating, that you control, that you've registered with your PROs, that you've gotten published, that you're collecting money on, and you can become your entire own business through all of this. You know, and it, obviously it all takes time. It all takes work ethic. But if it's something that you want to do and you're listening to this seminar, I'm assuming that, that you're going to put in the work ethic anyways. So I, I really hope that, you know, this has been, been helpful for, for you. And I'd love to hear any uh, questions or thing that we have. Yes, we do have a few questions that came in. So the first question is, how would you start a new artist getting airplay on radio or TV? Well, um, how would I start a new artist getting airplay on radio or TV? Well, I wouldn't uh, go to radio anymore. I, I think radio is is basically a a dead format in in, in sense for in an indie artist. The the model that I'm describing right now about creating your social network base, using your your biz manager, focusing on your Spotify Spotify profile to make sure these algorithms work to create awareness is how you get syncs and tv now i literally just had an artist i'm working with right now we just signed our first record deal i have another artist like two months ago we just signed her first publishing deal these things work because it's real and the only thing that matters in the industry now are working business models they don't they don't pitch stuff they don't want to go and like invest in hope they want to see something even if even if your following is only ten thousand people right if those ten thousand people are consuming your music and they're interacting and engaging with you they can see that because labels and these bigger companies Companies know they can scale a working model. So I would say like, you don't go to radio. I would focus all of whatever money because radio is really expensive. I mean, if you're going to go to a, a commercial radio campaign in the United States, like you're going to be at 30 to 50 grand just to go play, play on the field. And that's not even like competing with the people that are dropping six and figures, you know, multiple times. So the model is create the organic following, create something real, and then 
film and TV and all this kind of stuff will find you and you will be able to find it with these models. Like you can pitch it to them once you create this model and that's everything. Great. So the next one is not a question. It's more of a comment. This was one of the best things I've ever seen. Maybe it's common knowledge to many, but it blew my mind and offered a number of new avenues and opportunities. Great motivation and inspiration. So thank you, Jared. And we do have a couple more questions if you have some time. All the time. Yeah. Perfect. The next one is, can you recommend a boutique publisher? Uh, I can recommend uh, lots of them. The two that, that I really use are Sweets and Pop and, and one called Glow out of uh, Los Angeles. And I recommend everyone on this podcast to Google Carrie Kimmel, K-A-R-I-K-I-M-M-E-L. And she runs Glow. She was one of, I think, the most synced independent artists last year or two years ago. I don't remember. You'll have to look at the articles, a billboard thing insane amounts of sync, you know, and, and these aren't like huge, massive ones. It's, it's just tons of medium level sinks that, that, that are open to all of us, you know, and obviously there's some big fish that come in there too, but these kind of things, like, that's what I'm trying to say. If you do this and you build this organic following and you do these kind of biz manager stuff and you start growing your Spotify and you start creating noise and you start rising up in this algorithm, these things happen because they are looking for content creation because the labels have lost the stranglehold on the music industry. It is completely open right now for the first time ever. Great. The next question is, what is the biggest hurdle you had to overcome in your career? Uh, I think the biggest hurdle is failure. And um, it, it's, it's constant. Um, you, you're you're going to get 99 no's to everyone, yes. And if you can't handle that or you have thin skin or you're not open to constructive criticism, like you should just stop now because this industry is built on that. And the only way that you get better is by going out and, and kind of like wrestling with the best. And that's, that's what I meant about doing these collaboration and working with all these songwriters and working with other producers and kind of like getting an ecosystem because you have to get, go out there and you have to be open and you have to grow. And failure is going to be constant. Like you're, you're going to hear it constantly through the duration of your career. I, I get 57 no's a day. Um, but you know, when you get that one, it makes it all worth it. Right. Cause that's why we're here. That's what we're doing. We want, we want, you know, our artistry to be recognized and we want our artistry to be successful. So I'm telling you, if you do these things that I'm telling you and you do them consistently, you will have success. Perfect. The next question is what is your favorite role in the music industry? <laughs> uh, my favorite role, I, I think, is what I am now, maybe Omni role, because I, I kind of feel like that is that's where it's all headed. I, you know, it's been headed this way for a minute, you know, as it became more decentralized and especially with the pandemic. I just did a record for a label that was completely mobile, like they literally just sent me a vocal track with nothing. And, and I just did the whole production and like built the song around it all during the pandemic, like all completely mobile during like doing Zoom sessions like this. And, and this is kind of the future. So I think that everyone needs to start gearing towards that. And I, I'm not telling that everyone needs to be a producer or ever needs to be a mixer, but everyone needs to kind of understand that content creation needs to become localized in your ecosystem in, in a way that you're not in, in beholden to someone else for your success. And that's the most important thing that I want to assert to you is that everyone can do these things I'm talking about. You know, like maybe you can't produce as well, or maybe you can't mix as well, but you can do these other things that I'm doing as well as everyone else in the world. And that's just work ethic, consistency, getting your networks, doing your biz manager, writing these songs, like making whatever it is, your little niche as good as possible. And then filling in the rest as good as you can, right? Like I get tons of artists that send me their productions and like, I'm not going to put their production on the radio or, or not on the radio, but or release it. But it's still like, it's their ideas. And it's these kind of things. Like everyone needs to get this kind of rudimentary understanding of how to put these things together because that is going to be the future. Like I, I realize that right now, people that have never done this stuff are probably chasing the curve, but moving forward, like that's, that's where it's going. It's been going this way for a minute. The day of these like big studios and all these kinds of things where they're flying in all these producers and artists and players, like it's slowly dwindling. Like it goes on in Nashville, obviously a little bit still, but it's even that, like I, I work a lot over in Nashville and that system's becoming very localized in mobile hotspots and like these individual kind of content creators that can take something and deliver the whole finished product. And that's what you have to be able to do. Perfect. 
The next question is awesome presentation, great advice. I'm a studio designer, builder, and engineer. I would like to begin producing. In addition to your fantastic nut and bolts advice, what simple advice would you give uh, such a person? Uh, I think the, the thing that helped me the most was 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 fundamentals. Like I, I was a I was really, you know, into basketball when I was younger and played a lot. And, and I just remember my coach always telling me fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. And in production, that's like EQ and compression. Um, I spent probably two years fiddling around with like plugins and, and things. And I just didn't know what the hell I was doing until I really sat down and started learning the arithmetic of production. And, and I feel like that is, you know, you can do that. There's, there's tons of, of resources online that, that have like uh, Real Mix is a good one. And there's a few others on Google. You can just Google YouTube's great for this kind of stuff, but just kind of basic learning, like the fundamental stuff of compression and EQ and like basic mixing and panning like, and just doing it and then taking your songs and a B in them and being honest with yourself. Like, how do you get there? Like make yourself get there. How do you get there and start learning? Like it's just a continued education thing. Perfect. The next question is, can you recommend a, a reputable website or blog that contains this information that you're giving us? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, I, I Google, I guess. Um, you know, it, most of the stuff that I've learned has just come from doing it, you know, and, and uh, I'm going to put my content, contact info up here anyways for all of you. Um, I, I'm totally accessible. I work with a ton of artists. Like here's my email. This is my Instagram and my Twitter. That's kind of like my hubs, you know, follow me. And, and I'm, I respond to everyone. You know, if you're an artist and you want to do some marketing, like I, I do Facebook marketing for a ton of people. I help set up pixels. I help set up campaigns. I, I like to teach people. My whole thing is that I want to empower artists because I was in this, I was in a system, you know, where I, I did get screwed. I got screwed by some publishers. I got screwed by managers. I had some labels steal from me. I've had tons and tons of like that stuff happen. And that stuff happened because I didn't know these things that I'm telling you. And I can teach everyone to do this because if you are an artist, you need to be able to do this. Perfect. That looks like all the questions that came through. I want to thank you, Jared, for your time. And thank you everyone who joined this session today. Thank you so much. It was a, uh great to be here and please you know if you guys are interested or gals are interested you want to talk if you want to talk about production you know work together any of these kinds of things just please email me i'm always here to help and, and i like to do these empowering kinds of things so thank you for having me perfect i hope everyone has the great rest of their day